for sale by auction in London. A bronze figure, 25 inches high, made in Benin City, West Africa, sometime during the second half of the 16th century. The price given, 185,000 pounds, the greatest sum ever paid for a work of tribal art. These bronze pieces, and some 2,000 others like them, arrived in Europe in 1897, and they created a sensation. For they were so accomplished and so unlike the wooden masks and fetishes that explorers had brought back from Africa before them, that many people said that they could not be purely African in origin. They came to London as a result of a series of misunderstandings and murders that began here on the West African coast close to the mouth of the Niger River. Europeans had been coming to the West African coast for centuries. The first were the Portuguese back in the 16th century, but the British weren't far behind. And I'm standing in the remains of one of the British trading posts that were put up here at the end of the 19th century. To this place came loads of palm oil and palm kernels, most of which was shipped to Liverpool for making into soap. And it came from the hinterland. At that time, it was a little known country and ruled by a number of African kings, the most powerful of whom was the Oba of Benin. The first Portuguese visitors had brought back many stories of the Oba's military might and thought him so powerful that they took back an ambassador to Lisbon to be received by the King of Portugal. The Oba was a human god, so sacred that no commoner could look in his face. On the few occasions he left his palace, he was preceded by musicians and leopards, the symbols of his power. He owned dwarfs, just as European kings did at that time. He also practiced human sacrifice in order to sweeten his land with blood. Benin remained almost unchanged right into the 19th century. And then in January 1897, the vice consul of a British trading settlement on the coast decided to visit the Oba. The Oba had recently accepted a trading agreement with the British, but he wasn't keeping it. No palm nuts or palm oil were coming out of his territory, so the Oba had to be reprimanded. The traditional way to reach the city was to travel up the mangrove-lined creeks of the Niger Delta to the village of Ugoton, which marked the frontier with the Benin Kingdom. Messengers had been sent ahead by canoes with gifts to tell the Oba that the British Vice Consul proposed to visit him. But as they travelled upriver, they met messengers on their way back with a reply. The Oba did not wish to see the British at this particular time. The party reached Ugoton on the afternoon of January the 3rd. On the way up, they had been collecting carriers, and now they had the 240 men that they needed to carry all their supplies. But here there were more messages from the Oba telling them not to come. The local people gave them vehement warnings. It would be very unwise to go to Benin now, they said, for the Oba was celebrating Igwe. Igwe was and is the most important of all Benin rituals. It was last held in 1964 when these pictures were taken. During it, the Oba salutes the shrines of the earlier god kings, his ancestors, and renews his divine power. He parades and dances, decked with coral crown and tunic, with ivory bracelets on his arms and bronze masks at his waist. And sacrifices are made. Only by blood may the land be cleansed of corruption and kept pure. Special plants and earths are brought from all over the kingdom and pounded together with blood to make a magic medicine with which the Oba will be anointed to give him strength. And in 1897, as in previous years, the climax of Igwe was to be the sacrifice of a man. 
It may be that the Oba was trying to prevent the British Vice Consul from seeing these grisly rites. At any rate, his messengers did their best to persuade the British to delay, if only by a few days. But Vice Consul Phillips was not to be put off, and with his British companions and 240 carriers, he left Ugoton at 7 o'clock on the morning of the next day, January the 4th. Their only weapons were revolvers, and those they packed away in their baggage to emphasize that they were coming in peace. Yet they knew that the sacred and secret rituals of Igwe were continuing in the city even as they marched. <laughs> This is the path they took. It is so thin and narrow that they had to march in single file. And it wound through the thickest bush. The Benin chiefs, without the Oba's knowledge, had prepared an ambush. And at three o'clock in the afternoon of January the 4th, Vice Consul Phillips led his men straight into it. <laughs> Europeans and Africans were slaughtered indiscriminately. Only two Europeans escaped. The Benin warriors hunted them through these thick forests and came within yards of them several times. They had nothing to eat and the only thing to drink was the dew from the leaves. One of them was badly wounded, but after five days they reached the river. The wounded man's arm had already turned gangrenous. Both their bodies were black with thorns. The news of the massacre had gone ahead of them. And on January the 11th, only seven days after the massacre, it was in London. A punitive expedition had to be mounted. The British government summoned ships from the Cape and the Mediterranean. Marines were dispatched from England. By the first week of February, 1,500 men had begun the march on Benin. The battle was fierce, but inevitably short. The Bini tribesmen had no chance against Maxim guns and rockets. On February the 18th, after four days of sporadic fighting, and only six weeks after the massacre, the British took Benin City. In the abandoned palace, the victorious soldiers found wonders and horrors. The Oba, in panic at the impending revenge of the British, had, it seemed, embarked on an orgy of human sacrifice in an endeavor to stave off disaster, and the bodies of the dead lay in pits beneath the trees on which many of them had been crucified. The victors posed for their photographs in the palace courtyards. Stacked behind them, objects from the palace shrines that they were to bring back to Britain, either as personal souvenirs or official booty. There was an astonishing number. Sculptures of ivory, wooden masks, huge elephant tusks covered along their length with elaborate scenes. But above all, there were bronzes. The finest were of astonishing quality. Was it possible that the sculptors of this remote kingdom buried in the West African forest had produced entirely by themselves objects of such technical skill and sculptural inspiration that they rivaled the most accomplished works of Europe? There were many in Europe who were to doubt it. The Portuguese, after all, had once had great influence here. Surely it must have been they who taught the Bini how to make such splendid things. The British government, which was concerned with neither romance nor scholarship, put the loot on sale in order to defray the cost of the expedition to the taxpayer. And today, the treasure of Benin is dispersed among museums and collections all over the world, in Britain and America, Germany, Russia, Switzerland, Sweden, France and Australia. The second biggest collection is now back in Nigeria. 
but none of the objects have returned to the place from which they were taken, the palace of the Oba of Benin. A few weeks afterwards, the chief who led the ambush was tried and hanged. Others who had fled with the Oba returned and sued for forgiveness. The Oba himself was found innocent of plotting the ambush and sent to exile. He died in 1913, and that year his son, supported by the British administration, came back to rule again in Benin. Benin today is one of the main cities of Nigeria. The old palace was largely destroyed, but it has been rebuilt on the same site, and it still echoes with chants in praise of the god king of the Bini. Every morning, the palace chiefs arrive to take part in Ematon, the ceremony at which, day after day, they reaffirm their loyalty to the Oba. Just as European monarchs had keepers of the wardrobe, masters of the privy purse, and gentlemen ushers of the sword of state, so the Oba is surrounded by aristocrats who have been given titles because of the services they or their ancestors have rendered to the Oba. Each wears a necklace of coral beads that were probably brought here from the Mediterranean by the Portuguese and have ever since been handed out by the Oba to his noblemen as insignia that must be returned to the palace treasury on their death. Chief Omizuzi remembers the punitive expedition and recalls how his father hid him and his mother in the bush. His body is covered with faded tattoos, the signs of his aristocratic rank. With a knife? Uh, Penab, the Does it pain much? It pain? It pain too much. It pain too much. Every morning, the court herald makes his rounds of the palace shrines, reporting to the spirits that dwell there that all is well in the city and giving praise to the Oba. In their quarters, pages are preparing themselves. They were sent to the court by their parents when they were small children, as a gesture of loyalty to the Oba, and they wear brass anklets to show their status and seniority. Their costume is derived from the doublets worn by the Portuguese 400 years ago. A dwarf still lives in the palace, serving the Oba. He has the responsibility of looking after the shrines. Leather caskets containing kola nuts are brought from special storage places to be used in the Amaton ceremony. <laughs> It is now almost 11 o'clock. The chiefs of the Ibiwe society have been singing for hours. It is their responsibility to make sure that the palace is always alive with music and echoing with praise for the God King. And now, an announcement. The Oba is in his palace. The doors will now be barred. Ematon is now to begin.
In a reception chamber, the palace chiefs await the Oba's arrival. His Highness Oba Akenzua II, the grandson of the Oba deposed in 1897, who has reigned here since 1933. And now the chiefs, one by one, declare their loyalty. Ematon ends each day with a ritual performed by this man, the court herbalist. After its completion, he dances. He has anointed the Oba's body with medicine in order to renew his strength and thus the strength of the Bini people. It was a part of the ceremony that only the most senior of palace chiefs may witness. This cloak is sewn with magic charms, skulls of animals, pieces of horn, and fragments of metal. Over his shoulder, the medicine from which he draws his power. Outside the palace, the Oba's subjects are assembling. In the old days, he was the absolute ruler, dispensing judgment on any problem that his people brought to him. Today, the law is administered through courts, but many still prefer to seek solution to their disputes from the Oba and will abide by what he says. <laughs> This man has come from an outlying village to seek permission to hold a religious festival. But because he's a commoner, he may not address the Oba directly, and the request has to be made through one of the palace chiefs. I agree, says the Oba. Give him one coral bead as a token of my permission. In addition to religious protocol, the Oba also gives rulings on civil disputes. This woman has been brought here because she had attacked one of her neighbors and broken her fingers. One of my children was sick, she explains in her defense. I consulted the oracle and I was told that my neighbor had caused the sickness with some of her friends. She wouldn't tell me who the others were and that's how the trouble started. <laughs> The chief suggests that someone should go down to the village to sort things out. No, says the woman, I know my rights. I want things settled here. Beyond the reception chambers lies the harem. Once the Oba had over a hundred wives. Here the royal children are brought up. When they are ten or so years old, they must leave and never return, for no man other than the Oba and one court official may enter here. The queens have their own distinctive hairstyles, which none but they may wear. They also have their own shrines, where they and their friends make sacrifices. <laughs> The particular divinity they worship here is Olokan, the spirit of water, and therefore of fertility.
of a guinea fowl, says one, now send us your blessings. Thank you, Queen of the Water, says another, for delivering me safely of a child. Now, it is not possible to enter this chamber until you know three times. See, the most sacred shrines belong to the Oba himself, and I'm taken to see those by one of his sons. So I'm going to knock at the door three times before I open it. Prince Humphrey Akinzua is a graduate in anthropology from a Nigerian university. He's also a believer both in Christianity and the traditional practices of his people. This is where we keep our shrine for the departed Oba or the late Obas. Now, this chamber is very important to us. It's always a secret chamber. Here we have a shrine, one for Adola, and this one here is for my grandfather, Ewaka II. Yes. This is the traditional setting in the palace where you have the Oba at the middle, surrounded by his chiefs. Now, the mother you have here is um, a bronze cast of uh, my gr grandfather, Ewaka II. Now, you see, we have uh, two chiefs here, the front chief carrying what we call Asa. In terms of warfare, these uh, materials are usually used to guide the Oba from attack. Oba was one time a warrior. And what are these? These are thunderbolts. Thunderbolts? Thunderbolts, yes. We collect them uh, for our shrine because we believe that they are very, very powerful. And do they come, yes. come from the sky? Yeah, they come from the sky. They look like uh, axes, don't they? They do, uh, but I, I think uh, they have a natural shape. It is not carved. These are not, these are not carved it's by not human ca hands? No, it's not carved by human hands. Because we find such things elsewhere in the world made of stone, and they are there used for cutting, but here for that cutting. is not so. No, it's not so. They are usually done from the ground. I see. Uh, what is this, uh, uh, This is a bell, <coughs> cast in bronze. Now, this bell and the rattlestick are used uh, simultaneously during any ceremony or festival. This one is used to summon the, uh, the spirit of the ancestors <coughs> by ringing it. I the see. other one is used to confirm uh, prayers yeah. in the shrine by shaking it. Like this. And can anybody, anybody have heads like that and, and tusks? Yes, only the, ch only the chiefs. The chiefs, chiefs. yeah. Only the chiefs. Uh, as well as the Oba chiefs. As well as uh, chiefs as, uh, and, the, and the Oba as well. I see. Um, and when was this shrine set up? Uh, this shrine was set up by my father. Yes. When? Um, about 1933, when he came to the throne. Yes. Yes. And were all the objects made at that time? No, some of the objects were made before that time. Because uh, casting a brass is a long process. It is not possible to make a brass cast within a short time. I see. Uh, then are there bronzes being made now for the shrine of your father when he should die? Um, I would regard that uh, uh, question as uh, I can't reveal it you because it's a secret within the real court. I see. I wouldn't say my father would die in any case. Uh, and I don't want to reveal the secret of the Bini people because I quite understand. it will annoy them. Yes. It's the beginning of the Nigerian New Year, the time when Igwe and the most important of all the ceremonials used to be held. 
Quite unexpectedly, the entire congregation of one of the city's Christian churches has come to pay their respects to the Oba in front of the palace. <laughs> Their clergyman comes from another part of Nigeria and doesn't speak Bini, so his message has to be translated. May strengthen our Oba and endure him with more uh, abundant life and peace. No, not here, not here, not here, not here, not here, not here, so that his reign may be well established in this city and throughout Nigeria. And we pray also on behalf of the uh, chiefs that they may be in cooperation with, the, with our Baba and uh, everything may be going on smoothly. So that everything may be done successfully for the glory of God. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like his ancestors, the Oba's divine status requires that he should only publicly visit the outside world on special occasions. And I asked him how he spent his time in the palace. Well, in, in the usual way, sometimes when I used to play billiards, I play billiards at night. I hear you have a great reputation, Your Highness, for playing billiards. Well, I used to play, but I have not played there for quite a long time. <laughs> Uh, Your Highness, you also uh, play a great part in, in the religious life of your people, do you? Oh, yes, oh, yes. I noticed that you have um, a copy of the Holy Bible. Do you have the Koran, too? Muslim. Yeah. Yes, I have that. So would you uh, regard yourself as the head of both the Christian church and the Muslim church and the Hindu church, and also your own religion? Yeah, the Abba is, uh, is the religious head of all people. Uh, people of uh, Benin. Your Highness, many of us know about the bronzes that have come from your kingdom. They are very famous. Uh, can you tell me uh, why they are so important to the kingdom of Benin? Well, because uh, there were record of events. When the uh, British troops uh, came uh, here in 1897, uh, they carried them away. Um, what kind of events, Your Highness, uh, were represented in those plaques? Uh, any event of, uh, of record, yes. such as uh, you are here now, if it were in the old days, you would be uh, Recorded in the same way as uh, we have uh, recorded uh, the Code of England about uh, 1956 or so. That is the last one that Your Highness has commissioned. Yeah, that's right. The plaques, about a thousand of them, were found by the punitive expedition stacked in a storeroom. Apparently, they had been taken down some 200 years before. Once they had covered the pillars of the palace, and together they give a detailed picture of the Benin court at the height of its glory and power.
On the few occasions that the Oba left his palace, his sacred body had to be protected from the rays of the sun by the shields of his chiefs. His attendants, going before him, carry leather caskets containing kola nuts for the Oba to distribute as a gesture of patronage, just as he does today at the daily Imaton ceremony. One of the most technically accomplished of all the plaques, a masterpiece of bronze caster's art in high relief. It shows the Oba fulfilling his sacred duties by sacrificing a cow. The roof of the palace at that time was surmounted by a huge bronze bird. Below it, a great python, also of bronze, sprawls down over the wooden shingles. The pillars supporting the roof were covered with plaques, and the entrance to the palace was permanently guarded by warriors. One Oba was said to be able to raise an army of 100,000 men within 24 hours. Many plaques record their victories. This is a prisoner with a brutal sword wound across his chest. The scars on this man's face show him to be an Igbo from one of the tribes to the east of Benin with whom the Bini had many wars. When this plaque was made, the Portuguese had been in touch with the kingdom for something like a century, and they too appear on the plaques. They're shown with such accuracy that it's possible to date them from the details of their clothing. This man must have been in Benin in the early 16th century. He's armed with an elegant sword, but the Portuguese had more advanced and effective weapons than that. They brought cannons and muskets, the first guns that the Bini had seen, and they had crossbows. The Oba persuaded them to join his army, and with them on his side, he became one of the most powerful rulers in West Africa, conquering an empire that stretched for 200 miles along the coast from the frontier of present-day Dahomey to the banks of the Niger River. The Portuguese were seeking ivory, pepper, and above all, slaves. They oversupplied them, and in exchange obtained metal. One of the attendants waiting on this chief carries what was to become the standard currency on the coast, a European-made ingot of bronze, a manila. And metal from overseas is still eagerly sought after today. This is Igun Street in Benin City, where bronze figures are still being cast. Once they were made only for the Oba. Today, new versions of the old images are being made for sale to visitors, but also to townsfolk who take pride in having them in their houses. The craft is a hereditary one. The head of this workshop, the master bronze caster, is Osiosefe Emova. His apprentices and helpers, each with his particular job in the long process, are all members of his family, sons or nephews. The chief of all bronze casters, Chief Ine, is a frequent visitor here, as he is to all workshops in Igun Street. Hoseosefe moulds sheet wax round a core. He usually does this skilled work of modelling himself. Making the core of rough, sandy clay is a relatively easy job, which is done by the apprentices. <laughs> the core is only shaped in the simplest way. All the detail will be worked by Osiosefe in the wax with which it will be covered. Chief, what is this going to be? It's going to be a figure of Oba. A figure of the Oba. Mm -hmm. And Oba this, Benin. the Oba of Benin. Yes. And this, this is wax, huh? This wax. is wax. And, and where does the wax come from? It comes from the, the tree. The tree? Uh -huh. Where they are making their cell in the hole of the tree. Then you pick out the, the cell of a beast wax. How were the old ones done? Were they done in the same way? The old ones, same way. That's all, those things, 
They are called antiquities. Now. And, yes, they are. Yeah. Although the process is essentially the same, the antiquities differed in that most of the detailed work was done on the core itself, which was then covered with only the thinnest layer of wax. Today, the wax is not only thick enough to be modelled, but it's decorated with thin wax threads made by other apprentices. This will be the Oba's headdress. <laughs> and this, the coral bead coat that the Oba wears on important state occasions. The wings of the coral crown, an elaboration of the traditional regalia that wasn't introduced until the early 19th century. There you are, ma. When the wax figure is finished, it must be carefully covered with clay. This is a crucial stage. For the finer grain the clay covering, the more accurate will be the impression it takes of the wax beneath, and the smoother the surface of the finished bronze. In the old days, this must have been done with the greatest delicacy. When the whole figure, clay coating and all, has dried in the sun, the base is scraped clean to expose the ring of wax. These wax rods will form channels through the clay down which molten metal will flow into the mold. The clay investing them will also later hold the center core in place. And now the whole mold is heated so that the wax melts. Some of it turns to vapor, the rest must be poured out to be used again. During the casting process, molten metal will be poured into the mold to take up the space once occupied by this wax. Work on the day of casting starts before dawn. A huge fire is built in the compound, for the moulds must be heated to a high temperature if they're not to crack when the metal is poured into them. For metal, Osiosefe uses whatever is to hand. The Biafran War produced a great windfall for the bronze casters, and Osiosefe was already getting gloomy about where he would get such high quality metal once the supplies of spent cartridges were exhausted. Castings from old engines are also used. They have to be heated to make them brittle enough to be smashed into small pieces that will go into the crucibles. <laughs> And now, offerings must be made to Ogun, the god of iron, and patron divinity of all bronze casters, to ensure that the work that day will go well.
A cola nut is blessed in the name of Ogun and handed around to all who will be engaged in the business of casting. Raw spirit is spilled on the shrine. While the crucibles are filled with fragments of metal and flattened cartridges, Osio Sefe quietly goes to the fire where the moulds are still heating and makes a final libation over them. To produce the very high temperatures necessary to melt the metal in the crucibles, a furnace and bellows have to be used. The hot moulds are brought from the fire to be as close as possible to the furnace. And now, the crucial moment of pouring. The atmosphere is tense. The mold has cracked, someone shouts. The metal's leaking out. We need more metal. We don't. It's all right, says Osio Sefe. Leave it. Twenty minutes later, the mold is cool enough to be taken from the ground. If Osio Sefe was wrong and the mold has leaked, the casting will be incomplete and useless. As the face of the oba's head gradually appears, it seems all right. But you can't be sure until the outer covering has been completely cleaned off. It is complete, and it's finished off with a file. Perhaps it is this stage in the process which robs modern pieces of the sensuous subtlety of the ancient ones. No file has altered the delicate contours of this image. Until the end of the 16th century, metal was in such short supply that the craftsmen were extremely sparing with it. The bronze of the earliest pieces is of eggshell thinness and the delicacy with which the original wax was modelled and covered in clay was so great that little filing was necessary. 
So the disciplines imposed by a scarcity of metal contributed to the development of a style which surely represents one of the high watermarks of sculptural inspiration in all Africa. European experts might argue about the origin of this superb technique, but to the Bini there is no mystery. Their traditions state that it was taught to them by bronze casters from the sacred city of Ife, to which the kings of Benin paid homage. But no one in Ife today casts bronzes, and there's little solid evidence that anyone ever did, until in 1938, digging the foundations for his house, a man discovered 18 superb bronze heads. They were lying close to the palace of the king, the One of Ife. According to an Ife tradition, the god king in ancient times was ritually murdered after reigning for seven years. It was dangerous, perhaps, to allow the body of a god to age like a mortal man's, for it might risk the failing of the land's fertility. These noble, life-sized heads were probably displayed during the funeral rituals, wearing the royal crown as symbols of the immortality of divine kingship. Archaeological evidence suggests that these bronzes were made several centuries before the Portuguese arrival in West Africa, perhaps as early as the 12th century. So wherever else the tradition has its roots, it's not in 15th century Portugal. But were they also the inspiration for the bronzes of Benin? There is more than tribal tradition to link the two. This little figure was dug up in the palace in Benin, but from the regalia on its chest, it can be recognized as an image of the Oni of Ife in full ceremonial robes. And exactly the same regalia is modeled on one of the bronzes that was found in Ife itself. So here, almost certainly, is the source of the techniques and traditions of the bronze casters of Benin. But to see these lovely things, you have to come to Africa, for all but one of them lie here in the country of their origin. Unlike their descendants, the Benin bronzes, which, as a result of that rash expedition by Vice Consul Phillips back in 1897, are still scattered throughout the world.